Some of you might take a look at this tie featuring a guy wrapping all of his golf clubs around a tree and say, that's really weird. Why would you get so emotional over a game and destroy stuff that you paid money for? And you're right, it's weird. And it's a weird tie. And yet it feels so perfectly appropriate to wear this particular tie on this particular evening to talk about this particular show. Because above all else, SummerSlam 2018 was a freaking weird ass show. Like so weird, I don't even know if I could properly do it justice. Now weird doesn't automatically mean trash. Weird does not automatically mean it sucked. Weird can just mean weird. And it was just squirrely, weird, odd, like drunk. Like this is the type of show you would expect somebody really drunk to put together. I've seen far, far worse summer slams. And maybe part of it was that I haven't watched much of the week to week stuff over the past couple of months. So I'm feeling a little bit refreshed when it comes to wrestling, a little bit of a rosier perspective. And now I got to go through this review and try to bring everything crashing back down to earth. But nonetheless, let's talk about this weird ass night. And to me, it started off right at the beginning. Intercontinental Championship match. Seth Rollins, Dolph Ziggler. Last time I remember this match, wasn't it a 30 minute Iron Man match? So this time, instead of stepping up the stipulation, we're emphasizing buff Donnie Wahlberg. And thank you to Michael Corvin for pointing that out that he came back and he looked like buff Donnie Wahlberg. Kind of digging the look for Ambrose just a little bit. He cleaned up, looks like he might have actually showered, and he hit the gym. Godspeed to you. But imagine that, how weird it is that Dolph Ziggler is opening a pay-per-view in 2018. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> Fuck Dolph Ziggler! And when it comes to this whole match, it's kind of humming along. It's kind of a solid opener. Then they do this amazing spot off of the top rope. And of course, the crowd is ready to absolutely explode. Seth Rollins has done this magnificent thing. And that's not the end of it. And they go another five minutes just to get back to the same damn result. Where Ambrose doesn't turn heel and Seth Rollins win as he needed to. Uh, and become the new Intercontinental Champion. Which is one of those weird things to me about wrestling nowadays that frustrates the hell out of me. If you don't need to go an additional five minutes, if you don't need to do a bunch of additional damn spots, then don't. Sometimes, just call it over when it's appropriate. And this match went a couple of minutes too long for my liking. Uh, speaking of weird, the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. Somehow, someone, fits <laughs> the fan, thinks the Bludgeon Brothers and their stupid foam mallets are worth a shit and worthy of being tag team champions. Do you really remember much of anything that happened in this damn match? Really honestly, do you? The answer is no. Just weird. The Bludgeon Brothers. If that doesn't sound like a lower mid-card 1980s tag team name, then I don't know what the hell does. The SmackDown Women's Championship. It's not weird that Charlotte won, of course, because of course she won because she's freaking Charlotte. I think the whole thing that was weird here was that Becky finally lashed out and went under her big face turn. And that's right, I said it, her face turn. She kicked the shit out of Charlotte. That makes her a baby face in my eyes and I'm not the only one. The crowd there at the Barclays Center knew it. They understood it. And the only thing that would make this less weird is if you followed suit and had Charlotte turn as well and executed this type of double turn, which is what feels like it is called for here. I don't really remember much about the match, but I was absolutely down with Becky Lynch kicking the shit out of Charlotte. It's the most interesting I've been in something Becky Lynch has done in a long, long time, if ever. And it felt so good to watch Charlotte get the hell kicked out of her. Uh, the U.S. title match. By the time we got to that match in the show, you forgot that it was even coming up. It's reason number 69 of many 
that you know these WWE pay-per-views are just way too damn long. You forget all about it, and the fans apparently there forgot to care. You got golf claps for Jeff Hardy. Golf claps for Jeff Hardy. And no fucks given at all for Nakamura. And then after this match, which just felt like a complete and total cluster of a waste of time, as Hardy is laid sprawled out on the map, man, here comes Randy Orton. And you're like, Jeff, don't do it. Don't shake his hand. Don't do it. Orton comes out and then walks back up the ramp and does nothing. Just weird, man. And even the WWE Championship match between Samoa Joe and AJ Styles, which I liked. I liked it quite a bit. Doesn't necessarily measure up to some of the TNA battles over the years, but hey, I'll take it in 2018. That's cool. It's just, the whole time, it kind of felt like, and this is just weird because we're involving like a family type of angle with AJ Styles, but the whole time... It just felt like it had a Claire Lynch vibe to it. Or an Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, Dominic type of vibe to it. Not a good vibe. Match good. Stipulation, or not so much stipulation, but the storyline hook, maybe not needed here. That said, though, it was weird yet also kind of awesome to see AJ Styles do what a lot of people would do in this situation, go completely batshit, when somebody's talking shit to his wife, his kids, his fucking family. That made sense to me. So yes, of course, leave it to WWE to get Samoa Joe and AJ Styles on a big four pay-per-view and have the babyface champion get disqualified because the heels talking trash about his freaking family. I was kind of okay with it, I gotta be honest. There are much worse things on this show, believe me. One thing that wasn't weird... One thing that brought me some sense of normalcy to this entire night was The Miz versus Daniel Bryan. Now, this to me was my main event for SummerSlam. This to me was the match I cared about the most. This was the match I was the most interested in. This is the match I wanted to see. This is the match that had the most story to it. I didn't need to watch over the past few weeks to see how they progressed the story because it didn't matter. The story tells itself on a variety of different levels. And I know that for me, while I would have sure loved to have seen this been held off for WrestleMania, I was perfectly fine with this match happening here. Better for it to happen at a big four pay-per-view than not at all and be thrown away at freaking meaningless shows. As for the match itself, I personally enjoyed it tremendously. Lots of storytelling, lots of the chemistry in the ring between the two that you've seen before in years past, to me personally was on display here again. And even the way the whole finish went down with it revolving around punching Daniel Bryan in the face and Miz allegedly getting something from Maurice, allegedly, and hitting Daniel Bryan in the face. One, two, three, Bob's your uncle. The Miz is awesome. The whole thing that was weird about this, if there was one thing that was weird about this, is that Daniel freaking Bryan is in the ring at a big four pay-per-view. And you have more than a couple of fans chanting, let's go Miz. Now think about that for a second. This would be equivalent to Gargano versus Ciampa at a takeover show. And as much as those NXT fans love Gargano, Johnny Wrestling, imagine if you had a sizable segment of the audience, even if not the majority, just a segment of the audience chanting for freaking Tommaso Ciampa. Could you imagine that? That is, to me, the closest equivalency that I can make here. And it speaks to the Miz and the respect that he's earned. It speaks to the Miz and how he truly is the mid-card MVP at WWE. It speaks to the fact that he's a star no matter how much any of you in the comment section are going to crap on that concept, notion, or idea. No, he's not a freaking megastar, but who the hell is in today's wrestling business anyways? He is a star, though. And if you could get... The crowd, when you're supposed to be the heel, after all these years of waiting for this and all the history that's involved, even to get some of them to chant for you instead of Daniel freaking Bryan? 
It was a bizarre night. Really bizarre. Just like the decision when you have shows go four, four plus hours, you put all these matches on there. It's not a surprise to see maybe one of them end up really quickly. Maybe even two of them potentially, if spaced out well, be squash matches. But this company had three of them basically on the same damn show. First you had Braun Strowman squash Kevin Owens. Like, why even have the match? Like, seriously, why even have the match? Then you have Finny the Twink smash Constable Cornhole. Like, why in the fuck is Finn Balor wearing the demon paint for this freaking match? There was nothing about this match. There was nothing about this story. There was nothing about this feud. There's nothing, frankly, about Finn Balor's current position on the card that in any way, shape, or form felt like it was necessary for him to wear the demon paint. And again, the guy has two things going for him. The demon paint at big shows and his entrance. And ironically enough, they all tie in together as one. So once that's over, it's over for me. And frankly, more and more, it's over for more of you. And you're realizing the guy is kind of boring as bricks once you get past some of the kind of fluff at the very beginning of the thing. You might as well just given us an extended Finn Balor entrance for no particular reason or purpose because... Because why not? What do I better than this? Although I will say it was appropriately placed on the show to give everybody a nice poop, piss, shit break. You know, maybe go smoke, maybe go take dogs out. But then you have to be a squash match. You can't give us a break that late in the night. Give us a few minutes, please. And then the weirdest thing. Not that Ronda Rousey squashed Alexa Bliss and became the new Raw Women's Champion. I think a lot of us could see that coming, especially if there wasn't going to be some type of interference. And frankly, if you're going to have Rousey beat Alexa Bliss, it needed to be a squash. And while it technically went, I think, like four minutes, for all intents and purposes, it's a one-sided dominant squash, and everybody knows that. You have Natalia come out, and granted, wearing her dad's jacket from SummerSlam 1990, cool touch, but you also have the Bellas just randomly show up because we're going to start hyping up evolution now. Praise God of the, the all-women's pay-per-view named after his faction. That's the miracle and the majesty and the magnificence of everything on the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley, you sons of bitching blasphemers that don't believe. But you bring the Bellas and make this big deal about them being there, and then nothing happens. Natalia's there, and nothing happens. You just have the match, and then they celebrate afterwards. Like, what the actual F is that? But more so, what the actual F was up with that alien-looking predator shit eyeshadow job that Ronda Rousey had going on? What the hell? Like, you're supposed to be looking at her as a big-time badass bitch. Like, the female equivalent of Brock Lesnar in that women's division on Raw. How the hell are you supposed to take her seriously when she's wearing that crap? I don't get it. These kids nowadays. Good Christ Almighty. What the hell was that? You do the little thing with Elias even. That was freaking weird. Having a guitar break. It's like, what the? <sighs> but nothing could get weirder to me in spite of all the weirdness on this show. Nothing could get weirder than the main event, the WWE Universal Championship. Now, of course, the fact that this match main evented was weird to probably absolutely no one because you had to see this coming, didn't you? Didn't you? But what was really strange is after <clears throat> Brock and Roman have made their entrances, you get ready for the match, here comes Braun Strowman out with the monster in the bank, the money in the bank briefcase, wants a microphone, and he talks about the history of the money in the bank and knowing how a lot of the guys have cashed in and that they were cowards and doing it in a cowardly way. So he didn't want to be a coward about it. He wanted to be there face to face to tell him that after these two fight, he's basically got next. So you bring him out for Braun to talk about how he doesn't want to be a coward. And then he's still teasing basically a cowardly cash in. Like, this is supposed to be Braun Strowman. The way you do this with him when he cashes in, he cashes in clean. This is not hard to figure out. At this point in time, shit. You just have him cash in and make it a triple threat match. Now, we know ultimately why they had Braun Strowman come out 
More on that in a second. But initially, once the match actually did get started off, you teasing Brock being distracted by Braun, and all of a sudden Roman's getting in his licks, and you're thinking this is going to be yet another freaking squash match. Like, what the hell's going on here? But then it slows down for a little bit, and it's still only, I think, what, like six or seven damn minutes, so it wasn't particularly long. It was for what Brock Lesnar would think of now in 2018, a Broadway for him. Six or seven minutes. Woo! Got to go back on the farm and get ready to fight in UFC against Cormier, I guess. But they finally went with Roman. And even then, it was still cowardly. Even then, they made sure to present it in a way that the only way Brock Lesnar lost, after all this time of being a lame-ass absentee champion, was not because Roman Reigns finally got the one-up on him, not because Roman Reigns was just the better man on that given night, but because Brock was preoccupied with Braun Strowman and eventually went out there and yoked dude up. And then Roman basically caught him napping. And when the whole last spear went down and the chair goes out of Lesnar's hands and hits the rope and comes back and slides straight across Brock's face, it felt like that was the perfect, appropriate, fitting ending to this show, as weird as it was, for that to happen. It was the perfect and appropriate ending for Brock's universal title reign. It's the perfect, appropriate way to encapsulate how the WWE were so freaking cowardly when it came to Roman Reigns. You either do it or you don't. Either go all the way in and cream pie the crap, or you don't do it at all. The WWE for months has been hedging their bets and kind of going but not going, not pulling the trigger. And you make Roman look kind of pathetic here. Like, it's bad enough you're trying to sit there and invoke sympathy for a dude when you should be building him up as a freaking badass. Nobody wants to feel sorry for the dude, so then go in a different direction. So it's so weird that they were, wanted to go down this path of making him a sympathetic type of figure. Ding dong, dumb dicks, not gonna fucking work. The bluest of blue fucks were you thinking. But to top it all off, as weird as this freaking night was, Whereas you start this match and fans, of course, are chanting, both of you suck, you both suck. They're playing with beach balls and they're doing all this other crap. You think the WWE largely only put Braun Strowman out there to prevent people from leaving, to get people interested in the match, to tease something that for all intents and purposes we should have known right from the jump. What not going to fucking happen? After all of that, the fans hated Brock Lesnar's title reign so much and hated Brock Lesnar at this point so damn much that Roman actually got a bit of a baby face pop when he finally pinned Brock and won the damn championship. Bizarro world. Now usually WWE likes to use that term to describe the fans when they don't go along with the program. But Roman Reigns got a bit of a baby face pop for beating Brock Lesnar. After how many damn tries of not being able to do it. Sure, it felt kind of stupid and cheap and fell completely flat in my humble, not so humble opinion. But when all was said and done, at the end of this weird ass show, this weird ass night, Roman Reigns beat Brock Lesnar in the middle of the ring for the Universal Championship no cheer across the face could Brock Lesnar could stop Roman. And he got a damn baby face pop. What a weird ass night. You feel free. Chime in whatever you think about this year's SummerSlam. But it was weird, weird, freaking weird. That's about all I got to say about that. And just remember, it's now Shirt and Touch Lake Daddy. And this is Oterra Essentra. Not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need. Hopefully I haven't been too weird for you, but frankly, the weirder the better because it perfectly aligns with what we saw Sunday night at SummerSlam. See you later.